Isabella Linton was Edgar Linton's little sister. As a child, she may have been known for being a little spoiled, but over time she came to embody traits of keen wit and keen feelings, and a keen temper if you managed to get on her nerves. But she was loved by her family, and though it took some getting used to, her relationship with Catherine gradually formed into a mutual understanding of friendship. When Catherine had been injured by the Linton family dog, Isabella tried to help by emptying a plateful of cakes into her lap. And later in life, Catherine had in turn come to express plenty of affection for her. Matters change dramatically when Isabella develops an interest in Heathcliff, which may have come from a position of feeling left out. Christmas time at Wuthering Heights had left her without a dancing partner, and following Edgar and Catherine's marriage, the scene at Thrushcross Grange presents Isabella as something of a third wheel. When the day comes that she, Catherine, and Heathcliff go out for a walk on the moors, Isabella becomes frustrated by the notion that her counterparts are trying to avoid her. Isabella makes her case known, much to the aggravation of her brother, but much more so to the astonishment of Catherine. Heathcliff, by contrast, finds the development of interest, and it is Nellie who takes note of his plotting demeanor. She tells Mr. Lockwood, I saw him smile to himself, grin rather, and lapse into ominous musing. We know what Heathcliff is thinking because Catherine has insinuated, avarice is growing with him a besetting sin. Heathcliff wants to marry Isabella so that he can lay claim to the Linton estate, and it is from this point that we tend to view Isabella as naive and gullible for liking him. To her credit, it should be noted that Heathcliff has lived his entire life as a kind of outsider. If Catherine took to being his friend with immediacy, it may be that as a child she didn't really know what it meant to be prejudiced, as did her older brother Hindley, who hated Heathcliff from the very start. But Isabella is a grown young woman, and yet she seeks to allow for the inclusion of Heathcliff into the community of the locality. Isabella is trying to be sensible by refusing to listen to Edgar and Catherine's negative talk about Heathcliff. As a result, we learn about the ferocity that lurks within her ability to think. After she realizes that she's been duped, the first eight weeks of their marriage has her wondering whether or not Heathcliff is even human. At Wuthering Heights, she can barely secure a meal, much less a room to sleep in. She writes to Nellie and says, He is ingenious and unresting in seeking to gain my abhorrence. Heathcliff's treatment of her prompts the psychology of paying wrong for wrong. He's been behaving strangely over the loss of Catherine, and Isabella tells him to go stretch himself out over her grave and die like a faithful dog. And when he is found standing heartbroken by the chimney, Isabella blames him for Catherine's death and proceeds to laugh at him. Heathcliff throws a knife at her and she runs, but not without inflicting him with another mean-spirited remark as she goes. What we're seeing now is something far from the naive and gullible Isabella we once knew. Isabella moves to the London area, and though Nellie would give no information, Heathcliff discovered, through some of the other servants, both her place of residence and the existence of the child. He is steadfast and declares that when the time comes to claim the benefits of his marriage, he will act. They may reckon on that. Thirteen years later and we learn that Isabella has died. Recall what she once told us. I just hope, I pray, that he may forget his diabolical prudence and kill me. She tells Nellie, Do you think he could bear to see me grow fat and merry? Could bear to think that we were tranquil and not resolve on poisoning our comfort? And she had written to her brother of the probable conclusion of a four months indisposition under which she had suffered. What's going on here? 
Is there something to be made between the prospect of poisoning and the four months of suffering that led to her death? Heathcliff certainly has the means. Nellie has told Mr. Lockwood that he's rich. He has nobody knows what money, she says, and every year it increases. If we're to make inferences about Heathcliff's time abroad, we can reasonably assume that his travels included visitations to London, considering that it was such a critical location to conduct business during the age. And since we know that Heathcliff had Mr. Green, the lawyer, in his pocket, is it too much of a stretch to think that he could have paid off one of Isabella's maidservants? Was it not he who claimed, I have no pity? And Isabella even said, if ever I come into his hands again, he is welcome to a signal revenge. In reflecting on the loss of Catherine, Edgar regards Heathcliff as nothing short of a murderer. It's all wild speculation at best, but we have to conclude that the scenario is entirely plausible. Though Isabella had wounded him with words that stung deeply, it is she who remarks, a tiger or a venomous serpent could not rouse terror in me equal to that which he wakens. What do you think? Is it possible that Heathcliff sought to initiate the transfer of Thrushcross Grange into his name by eliminating his wife? Let us know in the comments. As always, please remember that Booktime Learning is dedicated to the study of writing and literature, so be sure to like and subscribe, and thank you for watching.